Welcome to chapter 9, part 1. We're going to talk about different articulations or joints. Here we have the definition of joints or articulation. So you can use these words interchangeably. Remember in the skeleton, if they weren't joined together, we called it disarticulate. So joints are where two bones are going to meet or bone and cartilage, like in the case of the rib cage, and bones and teeth. So teeth are not bones. We'll get to that in just a moment. The study of joints is called arthrology, and we have to look at the structure and the function. So I think of the structure as building material. So we'll talk about the fact that we have different joints based on the type of material that's used to create the joint. And then we also classify joints by their function. So I usually think about how much they move, right? So movement, um, functionality. Here are the structural classes of joints. So we have fibrous joints, which are held together by connective tissue, um, specifically dense connective tissue. We have cartilaginous joints that are held together by cartilage. And then we have a synovial joint that's going to have synovial fluid. So you're going to see bone to bone via a ligament. So they're attached via ligament. And then you're going to see this joint cavity around the bone attachment and around the ligaments. And then that is going to be filled with fluid. So this is probably the most familiar um, joint in the body. Most of us think of our shoulder, our hip, our knees. Those are all synovial joints. So we have to come back and talk about these um, fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints, and then we'll move into synovial. Here are the functional classifications. Um, these endings can change as well. So synarthroses, you can also see the term synarthrotic. You can see amphiarthrotic. You can see diarthrotic. So it doesn't always have to have this ending. It means the same thing. So I'm not trying to trick you if you see synarthrotic on a test. So synarthroses joints are immovable. If, you're, if it's an amphiarthrotic joint, it's slightly movable, has like a little wiggle to it. And then diarthroses are freely movable joints. Something to note here, when we talk about the three classes, right? So the first class was fibrous, the second was cartilaginous, I'm going to abbreviate, and the third was synovial. So these are the types based on structure. They're trying to relate the structure and the function. So do you see how synarthrotic and amphiarthrotic can be fibrous or cartilaginous? So both of these, they can be either syn or they can be amphiarthrotic. What do you see down here about diarthrotic? So all synovial joints are freely movable and makes them uh, diarthrotic, right? So one of the things we need to think about real quick before we start moving into these examples, you know, you might be thinking, why would we have bones that are not movable? Why would we have synarthrotic joints? Well, we're going to see that they're the most stable. And an example of where we're going to have these immovable synarthrotic joints are sutures, which are the articulation between two skull bones. So say the parietal and the frontal. You don't want to have um, wiggle room there, right? You want it to be the most stable because it's covering or protecting your brain, which is your supercomputer. But then when we move out to our appendages where our axial and our appendicular skeletons meet, we do want to have a little bit more mobility so we can rock climb and run and jump and do all these things. But they're a little bit less stable. So we're always trading off between, you know, stability and flexibility. Now we're going to talk about fibrous joints. So fibrous joints are held together by dense regular connective tissue. There's no joint cavity. You're only going to see that in synovial. These are immobile or slightly mobile. So we're talking about syn arthroses or amphiarthroses. And then these are the three most common types. And we're going to go through each one of these. First type of fibrous joint we're going to look at is the gum fosis. I always think gum, the G, makes me think of gums, 
So this is the articulation of the teeth with the bone, either mandible or maxilla. Remember we talked about the alveolar process well, that houses the tooth. And this is held in place with a periodontal ligament. So you're gonna have a periodontal ligament right here holding the root of the tooth in its socket. This is a synarthrotic joint. It is not movable. It shouldn't be movable, right? When we're chewing food, we don't want this tooth moving around in the pocket. Sutures are the next type of fibrous joint that we're gonna look at. So there's very short fibers that are attaching the two skull bones together in this image. And they form kind of these irregular edges. You shouldn't see a suture that's a straight line. These are also synarthrotic, they're immovable. Now remember in childhood, they're allowed to grow a little bit. From the time of childbirth, remember we talked about the fontanelles. So you're not going to have complete ossification um, until you become slightly older. Now we're on our third type of fibrous joint called syndesmoses. You can find these between the radius and ulna and the tibia and the fibula. You can see over here this real broad um, ligament uh, sheet called interosseous membrane, inter between osseous bone membrane. And this is amphiarthrotic, so it is slightly movable. We want to have a little bit of wiggle room. Remember when we're doing supination, bowl of soup in your hand, and we flip our hand over and do pronation, that the radius crosses over the ulna. So you have to have some slight movement here. What I would do is create an outline as I'm going through. So the first we did, we're talking about joints, right? And the first group that we looked at are fibrous. I would then come down and tell the three types of fibrous joints, um, gomphosis, sutures, and syndesmosis. Then I would give an example. What's an example of gomphosis, right? Teeth to maxilla mandible. Then I would tell something about function or movability, right? So then for movement, gomphoses are synarthrotic. And I would do that for each of these, not only list the type of fibrous joints, give an example of each type, and then tell me something about their movement. Cartilaginous joints are either made of hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. Remember, hyaline cartilage is at the end of all bones, right? Articular cartilage, that's hyaline cartilage. And remember, fibrocartilage, we've talked about um, compression resistant. So you had fibrocartilage between your vertebrae, right, the meniscus of your knee. They also lack a joint cavity. So both fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints do not have a cavity. They do not have fluid. They are totally different than synovial joints. And these are going to be immovable or slightly movable. So we know these terms to be synarthrotic and amphiarthrotic. I'm going to abbreviate. There are two types. So the first type is called synchondroses and the second type is symphysis. First type of cartilaginous joint we're going to look at is called synchondroses. This is when the bones are joined by hyaline cartilage, and we've talked about hyaline cartilage before. Um, if you remember our epiphyseal plate or our growth plate, so if we're joining one bone to another piece of bone via hyaline cartilage, it's called synchondroses. And these are immobile, immovable. These are synarthrotic joints. So we don't have wiggle room here in our epiphyseal plate. And remember, this is only in childhood and adolescence. And then when you become an adult, this is no longer um, an epiphyseal plate. It then becomes an epiphyseal line. So you would not have this example as an adult. Now the rib cage is a little confusing. So here, where the hyaline cartilage attaches to the rib, this is an immovable joint. This is a synarthrotic joint. 
where the very first, this is rib number one, where the very first rib articulates to the manubrium, remember that's the manubrium of the sternum, that is also a synarthrotic immovable joint. But guess what? All of these guys are going to be synovial joints. So it's kind of confusing. Your rib cage has to do a lot, right? It has to protect, but it also has to expand in order for your lungs to take in more air. So bottom line, what are examples of synchondroses when we talk about the thoracic cage? So rib one to sternum, and then rib two coastal cartilage all. So every rib to coastal cartilage connection is an example of synchondrosis. Both of your rib number ones to your sternum are an example of synchondrosis. Everybody else is going to be an example of a synovial joint that we'll talk about later. Second type of cartilaginous joint is called a symphesis. We've already seen this, a pubic symphesis. Remember this fibrocartilage compression resistant pad between your two coxal bones or os coxa. So remember here's the pubis region of the os coxa. And as you're walking, this pubic symphesis stops the two pubic bones from kind of smashing together when you walk. So remember, this has to be slightly movable because as you're moving, you're pulling one leg forward, including your hip, and this one stays backward. So you have a little bit of pull here. You have a little bit of movement. Same thing with your vertebrae. Here we have our intervertebral discs, again, made up of fibrocartilage. And think about if you're standing up and you want to tilt backwards, right, you have to have some slight movement. Or if you want to bend over, you have to have some slight movement as well. So both of these are examples of symphesis, and these are uh, amphiarthrotic. Now we move into synovial joints. We have to talk about some features before we list out the types of synovial joints, but I wanted you to see that there's a joint cavity that's created by these membranes and that we have a freely movable or diarthrotic joint because we're going to have some fluid in here that's going to assist in making this joint freely movable. Some of the basic features First, we need to look at the articular capsule. So here's articular capsule. We have a synovial membrane. And can you see that the synovial membrane is attached to the articular cartilage? Remember the hyaline cartilage that lines all long bones. So we have the synovial membrane attached to the articular cartilage. And then we have fibrous connective tissue and these two, fibrous, connect, fibrous layer and the synovial membrane, make up the articular capsule. Then we have a joint cavity that's formed. So what's the joint cavity formed from? The articular cartilage, the synovial membrane, and the synovial membrane is going to secrete synovial fluid. So that synovial fluid is secreted by the synovial membrane. So real quick, what type of tissue do you think this is? Are we learning and purging or are we actually retaining? So what type of tissue did secretion? Single layer secretion. Hopefully you're yelling epithelial tissue at me right now. Okay. Um, the last thing you're going to see is the ligament, and I know it's kind of hard because I've written over everything, but it's this white structure right here. So let me do purple. This white structure. So we have a ligament that's offering support to the articular capsule. You can go through the next couple of slides and look at all of the uh, information about each layer. So remember the articular capsule includes both the fibrous layer and the synovial membrane. The articular cartilage is created from hyaline cartilage. It's on the surface of the joint. It's going to help reduce friction. It acts as a cushion to absorb joint compression. 
So the joint cavity is the space that's created between the articulating bones. So remember we have articular cartilage, articular cartilage, and then we have synovial membrane. And this synovial membrane is secreting synovial fluid. The synovial fluid is going to lubricate the ends, lubricate the ends of the bone so they can move freely. It's also going to provide nutrients and remove waste from the articular cartilage. Remember, articular cartilage is avascular, so it doesn't have its own blood supply. So basically, the synovial fluid is going to help. And then acts as a shock absorber. So basically, the synovial fluid is allowing the joint to move more freely. So it would make sense if you have low synovial fluid, your joints are not going to perform as well or function as well. Lastly, we talk about ligaments. This is dense, regular connective tissue. Remember, we have our joint cavity. So we have our articular cartilage. We have our synovial membrane. And then we have ligaments that are going to attach bone to bone, but they also reinforce the synovial joint. They help give stability to your synovial joints. We also have sensory nerves and blood vessels that are going to the joint cavity. Um, think of them as kind of warning you you're overstretching or you're putting too much strain on the joint and it's going to cause pain to get you to try to stop whatever it is you're doing. We also have to talk about tendons because tendons are going to come in and remember this is attaching muscle to bone. They also help stabilize the joints. So these are made of dense regular connective tissue. It's not part of the synovial joint, but it does help stabilize the joint. So we have to talk about it. This image is for the bursa, which I'll point out right now. Bursa are these tiny little sacs of synovial fluid. So not to mention the synovial fluid that's inside my joint cavity, we also have sacs of synovial fluid that kind of aid in the movement at a particular joint. One of the things to pay attention to, here's the joint cavity, kind of irregular shaped here at the knee, right? That's the joint cavity. It consists of a synovial membrane and articular cartilage, and there's gonna be synovial fluid inside the joint cavity. Then remember I said we have ligaments. So we're going to have a ligament that comes and offers support to this joint cavity. On top of the ligament, we also have tendons. And those tendons are going to come down and offer support to the joint cavity. So the stability of a joint depends on the ligaments, the tendons, and then the actual joint cavity itself, right? The strength of your synovial membrane and the amount of articular cartilage. So everybody's contributing. And one of the things to think about, we may not be able to control this, right? You either have ligaments that are nice and stretched or you don't. Maybe if you do yoga, you could stretch out ligaments a little bit more, but what are you really working on? You're working on tendons. So anytime that you work out, you do any sort of stability exercises um, or flexibility exercises like yoga, you're lubricating these joint cavities and you're helping to create a taunt or tight tendon. And if the tendon is tight against your joint cavity, you're less likely to have any kind of slippage inside that joint cavity. So bursa are fibrous sac-like structures that contain synovial fluid. They're uh, lined by, the by a synovial membrane. So it's synovial membrane sac that's secreting synovial fluid. These are connected to, or they can be separate from the joint cavity and they help alleviate friction. I wanted to show you this image from part two early because I wanted you to see why we might need bursa. So here's a bursa. This is a sac of synovial fluid, and it's strategically placed where the humerus fits into the glenoid cavity of the scapula. So we have this joint cavity. We also have three bones. We have clavicle here, we have scapula here, and the humerus. 
we also have several tendons from several different muscles. So remember on the back side, well, I shouldn't say remember, we haven't talked about it yet, but maybe you know triceps brachii. On the front, we have several muscles, one of them included biceps brachii. And all of these attachment points are on the scapula. So remember that the bird's beak, right? Um, we talked about the coracoid process that we're going to have several tendons from several muscles all attached in this area. Well, if we don't put a bursa here, is it possible that we could have a bunch up or a kink in the tendon that would get stuck in the movement or rotation of your shoulder joint. So hopefully we can see anywhere we have a lot of complex structures, we have a lot of tendons, we have a lot of bones, we have a joint cavity that we might strategically put in bursa, obviously through evolution, right? We don't tell our bursa where to go, but that having those bursa allow the shoulder joint to be more uh, flexible and not let anything get caught or impede the movement of the shoulder joint. Some other structures, we have tendon sheaths. They're just elongated bursa that wrap around tendons. We're also going to see fat pads that act as kind of a protective packing material. This is a nice image to show you why we would need tendon sheaths, especially if we're moving through a small area. So all of our tendons that control our digits, our phalanges, all of the muscles are located in the forearm. So in your antibrachial area is the location of the actual muscle and the tendon sheath comes out and attaches to the phalanx. We have 10 tendons that are running through this very narrow carpal region. You can see why we would want to have an elongated bursa to wrap around a tendon so that the tendons don't cross over each other. I like to think of them as staying in their lanes so that they can uh, fan out into the digits and that there's no crossing over under, there's no getting pinched as we move through this narrow section. Synovial joints are classified by movement and also by shape, and we'll see shape on the next slide. But for movement, we know that synovial joints are freely movable and they're diarthrotic, right? But because of some of the joint surfaces and the shapes of the bones, some of them have limited movement. So we're going to look at uniaxial, biaxial, and multiaxial. Here are the classes of synovial joints by shape. So what do they look like? We have plane joints, we have hinge joints, we have pivot, we have condylar, we have saddle, and we have ball and socket. What I would like you to do for synovial joints, name them, so be able to tell me these six joints are all examples of synovial joints, then give me a specific example of a plane joint and then tell me about its movement. So that's the uniaxial, biaxial, or multiaxial. This is a great image from your textbook that goes through all six synovial joints with an example. You can see the plane joint here. It is a uniaxial. There's movement really in only one direction. And that example that we give in the body are the carpal bones. So where you have one carpal bone articulating to another carpal bone, it's still a synovial joint. It just does not have complete movement, right? It's not a ball and socket. So it has a little bit of movement. It moves uniaxial in one direction. And then we have the hinge joint. This is the example I was talking about earlier. Here's your humerus, your radius, and your ulna. Because of this bone feature, I can only move my forearm up to my shoulder. I cannot take my forearm and move it backwards, right? That's because of the shape of the bone and the fact that my olecranon process fits into that olecranon fossa. So that's a hinge joint. Over here we have a saddle joint. 
Best example is where your carpal bones meet your metacarpals. So we can see here trapezium, that's one of the carpal bones, and it's meeting metacarpal one. A saddle joint is biaxial. You can move it in two directions. So you can take your thumb and make it touch your pinky and then go back, or you can make your thumb touch your first finger and go back. So it can move in two directions. Next, we have a condylar joint. Best example is right here where your knuckles would be. So where your metacarpals meet your phalanges would be a condylar joint. You can shake your finger back and forth and say no, like no, no, no. Or you can take your finger and move it forwards and up, right? You can take your finger down and touch the palm of your hand and then move it back up again. So that's, you're moving in two planes, that's biaxial. Then we have a pivot joint. You can see this is best described where the atlas and the axis come together. Remember we talked about the dens of the axis and we said you can move your atlas to say no or you can move your atlas to say yes. So that's a good example of a pivot joint. Now we come to ball and socket. You can see that this is multi-axial. So this would be the head of the femur into the coxal bone or the humerus into the glenoid cavity. So again, I would go through list one through six type of joint, give me an example of where you can find that joint and then tell me something about its movement. So plane joint, hinge joint and pivot joint are all uniaxial. Saddle joint and condylar are biaxial, and ball and socket is the only joint that's multiaxial. Now we're moving on to talk about motion. So how do we move our synovial joints? So we're still talking about synovial joints. We're not going to move our sutures, right? Our fibrous joints between our skull bones, we're not going to move those. So we're talking about synovial joints and we're talking about range of motion, how they move. So one of the movements that you can do with your carpals and tarsals would be kind of a gliding motion. So I think of it as, you know, the princess wave where you barely just kind of move your hand back and forth. So your carpal bones can glide back and forth, but it's a limited movement. Flexion and extension are opposites. If you're flexing, you're decreasing the angle. If you're doing extension, you're increasing the angle. So flexion, if I told you put a weight in your hand and flex, you would probably know to pull your forearm closer to your chest. Right? You would lift the bar up and pull it to your chest. That's flexion. So to kind of make that movement, right? This is your forearm and this is your humerus. Extension would be to go from this angle to drop your arm back down to your side. We've increased the angle. Hyperextension is where we extend more than 180 degrees. So if this was extension and this was flexion, hyperextension would be this way, the opposite. So more than 180 degrees. Lateral flexion occurs between the vertebrae in the cervical and lumbar region. This is if you move the trunk of the body. Here's some good visual examples for you. So if I'm in anatomical position and I touch my chin to my chest, I had this angle and now I have this angle. I've decreased the angle, so that is flexion. And then I can move back to extension or I can also do hyperextension. So I had this tiny angle and now I have this angle. So hyperextension is past extension. With flexion as well, you can see here, the arm is being flexed. If I bring my arm back to anatomical position, that's extension. But remember at the elbow, I cannot do hyperextension. Here's the hand, it's at normal, right? We're going to flex, we can bring it back to extension or we can hyperextend.
So flexion, we made the angle smaller. Hyperextension, we made the angle larger. You can see here, if I want to flex the lower leg, I'm bending at the knee and I'm doing flexion, decreasing the angle. Remember, we cannot do flexion, I mean, excuse me, hyperextension at the knee. So basically, no, no hyperextension at elbow or knee due to the surface features, either the patella for the knee or the olecranon process for the elbow. And here is lateral flexion. We also have abduction and adduction. I know it says abduction and adduction, but sometimes they'll emphasize abduction and adduction as not to confuse anyone. So abduction or abduction is moving the body part away from the midline. And AD or adduction is moving it towards the midline. You can see here if I engage my shoulder joint, I can do abduction to raise my arm up. And then when I bring my arm back to the side, it's adduction. I can also do this at the wrist. And I can also do this at the fingers. So here's a good example of abduction. I'm spreading my fingers out. A deduction, I'm adding them back together, I'm bringing them back. Same thing with your leg. So if I lift my leg laterally, that's A deduction. If I bring it back medially, that's A deduction. Circumduction is really if you take or do um, A deduction and A deduction over and over again, right? So you lift it up, which would be a deduction. You bring it back down, that's a deduction. And you make a kind of this cone or circle in the process. Basically, you're making circles. That's circumduction. I wanted to use this image here to kind of drive home the point that you have to be very specific about the joint you're talking about when we do these range of motion. So here at the hip, can I lift my entire leg forward? Can I do flexion? Yes. Can I bring my leg back to extension? Yes. Can I hyper flex at the hip? Can I bring my leg backwards at the hip? Yes. So I can do all three of those at my hip joint. But now go to the knee, or let's go over here. If I'm talking about the knee joint specifically, can I flex? Can I decrease the angle? Can I kick my lower leg behind me? Yes. Can I bring it back to extension? Yes. Can I do hyperextension? Can I isolate this joint and move my uh, lower leg forward and have an increase in angle? No, I cannot. Remember I said there's no hyper at the elbow and the knee joint. So just be careful that if you're reading a question that you know exactly which joint we're asking about and then that'll help you kind of answer the question. We also have rotational movements. We have lateral rotation, we have medial rotation, um, we have pronation and supination. This is that forearm movement that I alluded to earlier. So pronation, your hand, the palm of your hand is facing down or posterior, um, almost like if someone was gonna put a ring on your finger, that's pronation. Um, and then supination is if you're holding a bowl of soup. So your palm of your hand is facing forward or anterior, or think of yourself as holding a bowl of soup. Nice images of rotational movements. We can rotate our head. Um, we can rotate our appendages here, our arms and legs, uh, either laterally towards the outside. You can see the foot's facing outside or medially where the foot is facing inside. You can see pronation here. The back of the hand is facing forward and in supination, the palm of the hand is facing forward. I did want to mention that these terms can be used for the whole body as well. So if I said lay supine, your face is up, right? You're laying down, both of your palms um, are face up. If I said lay prone, prone means lay on your stomach. We have some special movements. They don't fit into other categories, so we kind of give them their own. So we call them special movements. The best example here for depression and elevation, I think, is the movement of the mandible. In order to open your mouth, you have to do depression. 
to move the mandible inferiorly. And then in order to take a bite of something, you have to move the mandible superior. You have to move it back up to meet your maxilla. So we have to do depression and elevation of the mandible in order to consume food. We have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. These are limited to um, the ankle joint here. You can see dorsiflexion, your toes come up, like when you're digging in your heels, or if you've ever heard of a heel strike, like in karate or taekwondo. And then plantar flexion is when you're on your tippy toes, right? So toes are down, you have an arch in your foot, that is plantar flexion. We can also do eversion and inversion of the foot. So if I wanted to look at the inside or the sole of my foot, I would turn it medially. That would be inversion. I'm moving it in. If I wanted to look at the lateral aspect of my foot, I'm going to turn my foot to the side and I'm going to look at the outside of my foot. That's eversion. We also have protraction and retraction. Um, again, this is kind of a mandible movement here. If I jut my chin out, that would be protraction. And if I pull my jaw back in, that would be retraction. So in order to consume food, you have to do protraction, retraction, and you have to do depression and elevation of the mandible. So you need all four of these movements in order to take a bite of food and grind it up and swallow it. Opposition and reposition is limited to the thumb. Have you heard of opposable thumb? Opposable thumb means you're able to do opposition. You can touch the thumb to the tips of all of your other fingers. Remember we only have two phalanx here so that our thumb is an extra long where we have three phalanxes with our phalanges. So opposition is touching the thumb to the tips of all of your fingers. This enables you to grasp objects. This allows you to do fine detailed work. Think about if you're holding a pen right now to take notes. You're doing opposition. Your thumb is meeting your first digit, right? And then reposition is just bringing it back to normal position. So if you want to do something fun, we did this back in high school, but I still think it's fun. Tape your thumb to your palm, either to the side or to the inside. And now with your four free fingers, see if you can tie a shoelace, if you can button a button. Could you hold a pen? So I really want to make it very clear that opposition is a great thing. The ability to do fine detailed work, right? Also, what I would do for this chapter is do the outline. I know I talked about this in the beginning, but we've learned a lot of information. So I would go through and I would talk about or list out the fibrous joints, the cartilaginous joints, and the synovial joints. Give me an example of each. Tell me whether they're synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, or diarthrotic. And then for synovial, tell me what type of axial. Are they uniaxial, or are they biaxial, biaxial, or are they multiaxial? So that's kind of an additional step here with the synovials. Then I would go through the range of motion that we just talked about and list out um, where can you do flexion? Where can you do extension? Where can you do hyperextension? Which ones are specialized movements that you can only do? So opposition is only the thumb right? The mandible is depression, elevation, protraction, retraction. The foot, right? Eversion, inversion, dorsiflexion at the ankle, or plantar flexion. So if you create an outline, it makes it a little bit easier to um, keep some of this information uh, kind of in order so that you can learn it. I'll talk to you next PowerPoint. Bye!